How many of you know a fake Christian? Anybody know a fake Christian? Yeah, yeah. That's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> we want to be real Christians. We want to be authentic. I remember when the, the, when the French word faux began to emerge in our culture, which is French for fake. I didn't realize that. It was faux leather. It's like, oh, it's a different kind of leather. No, <laughs> it's pleather. It's plastic. And uh, we want to be genuine, right? And that has to do with this book of uh, wisdom that we're going through. I know some of you are using it as your evening devotion. Some of you are using it as your morning devotion. Um, I'd encourage you, as many of you have discovered, it's, it's very helpful to have read the proverb before you watch the devotional. That's very handy. Uh, but the entire family is going through that this month. If you're behind, don't worry. Just catch up. You don't even have to catch up because they come down every day. Tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. Now, in the nine gifts of the Spirit, there is the word of wisdom. And unless you operate in that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're going to find an occasion where you just need some general wisdom, right, to get through life. And um, gosh, there's just so many examples. And, and the one the Lord illuminated to me this past week was uh, flying. Do we have any pilots in the house? Any pilots in the house? No. Yeah. Oh. Chris, you're a pilot? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, so um, I am not a pilot. I, I took pilot lessons uh, for a season. And uh, when I discovered my wife wouldn't fly with me, <laughs> I said it was, it, was, it was a very hectic time in my life. And I was passing the tests with B's and C's, which is not normally what I do. I'm a kind of an A person. And I was very proud of myself that in the middle of all this, I was still getting up at five o'clock in the morning, going out to the airport, taking these classes and, and so forth. She goes, I'm not, I'm not flying anywhere with anybody that gets a B on a flight, on a, on a, on a, on a flight test. <laughs> so uh, life got busy again and, and, and I stopped doing that. But, but I've learned a few things about that and um, there's basically two types of flying. There's IFR and VFR. Uh, VFR is visual flight rules. So that means you can fly as long as you can see out the window. And if you go in the clouds, you're not allowed to go in the clouds. There's clouds over there. Let's go through those. That'd be fun. Nope. If you are, an, if you are a VFR pilot, you're not allowed to fly through clouds. And that's why you check the weather. Oh, the ceiling, the, the weather is, oh, look at all, the clouds are at 5,000 feet, which means you're not allowed to fly above 5,000 feet. And if the weather gets weird or dicey, you got to land. You are not allowed because you are a VFR pilot. You're a visual flight rules pilot. And that's how every beginner starts, is looking out the window and making sure that you can see everything. You become more advanced. I have a cousin, or no, I have a niece I have a niece uh, who, who is a, a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. You can go, ooh, because that is cool. Um, but she's also a, a single engine pilot, and she's, a, and she's just about ready to test for her, her, her double engine. Um, her name is Becky, and she's out at Bethel in California. And uh, she uh, is a, a VF, a, an IFR, an IFR pilot. An IFR pilot means you have an instrument rating, hence the letter I. Instrument flight rules. That means that you file a, a flight plan, you tell them where you're going to go, and then you take off, and you can fly at night. You can fly in pitch black. You can fly if someone put cardboard over the front of your windows, because what you're going to do is you're going to look down those instruments. You're not going to trust whether or not you feel like you're at an angle, or you feel like you're at an angle, or you look down and you see the ground. Everything is done by the instrumentation. You fly by instruments, IFR, instrument rated flying. And I thought to myself, this is a lot how people go through life. We go through life pretty much as VFR pilots. I see that, I'm gonna do that, I see that, I'm gonna do that, I see that, I'm gonna do that, and blah, 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 and things get kind of crazy and spicy, and, and I don't know, and the weather's getting bad, we land our plane just to ride it out. The book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs, is your flight manual for IFR flying. It allows you to fly in the weirdest of times, in the weirdest conditions, even though you can't see, you can begin to see through the instrumentation of the word of God. 
Are, are you following with me here? This is because sometimes, you know, it gets crazy and whatever, and you really don't know what to do, and I don't know what, is, what does wisdom say to do, or what is, what is a, we talked about this last week, common sense, right? The problem with common sense, it's common, right? So common sense is looking out the window, it's all good, I can do this, I can land this, I can fly there. And you fly, it, honestly, you fly, I did take some ultralight lessons, and uh, you fly uh, and, uh, by water towers. If you don't know where you are, you just get low enough to find a water tower. You read the law of water tower, now you know where you are. It's pretty crazy. And you follow rivers. And that's all by, by visual, visual flight rules. But there is times in your life, there's times in my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing multiple times a week, at least for me, I go, I really don't know. I better look at the instruments. I better check to make sure my, my plane is flying. Now, it looks like my plane is flying flat and level according to what everybody else's looks like, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna risk my life and the passengers, my wife and children and grandchildren, I'm not gonna risk their life based on what, how all you all are flying. I'm gonna base my life on what the instrument panel says. Is my life right? Am I flying true to the horizon? So if you're with me on that, say amen. amen. So that's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, not everybody is an IFR pilot. I'm a Christian. I say the sinner's prayer. Congratulations, you are a visual flight rules Christian. Welcome to the party. But if you want to mature, you want to grow, you got to go to the next level, and that's having some instrumentation, the word of God that's alive in your life. Now, we've been going through Proverbs. They talked about it in the announcements online all this month, every day. The seventh day is the seventh proverb, and so on and so forth. So this book is important. It gives us perspective. Well, that's an old book. Solomon wrote it. It's, you know... Uh, 2,000 years old, 1,000 BC. What, what does that have to do with today? Well, the topics are things like choosing your companions wisely. Front row. <laughs> choosing your companions wisely. Contentment over covetousness. The importance of planning. Being patient, having self-control, being discerning. The art of hard work and diligence, humility, righteousness versus wickedness. The importance of a good reputation is in the instrumentation. Generosity, compassion, saying no to laziness, honoring God with your finances. It's like God, you know, uh, I've fallen into the, to the, to the clickbait before where it says life hacks. You ever seen this online? Like a life hack, which means here's something hard, but I'm going to show you the easy way to do that, right? They're called life hacks. That is what we have in the book of Proverbs. Why, why, are, you, why are you struggling with the flight plan of your life? God has given you everything you need in the book of Proverbs and in his book in general. And they're, and they're summed up with these three main ideas. We put them on the screen for you. They are the for number one, three categories, wisdom and knowledge, the power of words, and moral living. Now, if you were with me last week, uh, we discussed, number one, wisdom and knowledge, right? We talked about the key verse. We talked, that's all we talked about all day long was Proverbs. And the key verse is Proverbs 1-7. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and knowledge. All right, so go back to those three. So you have that one, wisdom and knowledge. That's what we talked about last week. Today, with supersonic high altitude speed, we are going to preach two sermons in one. We're going to cover power of words, which is the second article of, of the book of Proverbs, its thesis, and then uh, thirdly, moral living. So if you're ready, say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, hang on. Amen. Here we go. We're going to talk about the power of words for a couple minutes. The power of words, if in the book of Proverbs, and I really suggest that you, you, you bring your Bible. I know we put it on the screen for you, but it's nice to have these things here in front of you. And if and Proverbs 18.21 is not underlined in your Bible, it really should be because this is what it says. The power of life and death are in the tongue. You know how important that is? That means the things that come out of your mouth. In fact, darkness was over the face of the earth, and then God said, he spoke the power of to create in the words, life and death. Proverb warns over and over and over. Again, these are three main points. We're just, we're just taking a, 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 just a, 
a mountaintop view over the top of the book here. But it warns us against gossip and reckless speech and lies and encourages us always to speak the truth because the power of life and death is in the tongue. Your words, your words, your words create an environment for you. They create an environment for you. It's how, it's those little recordings that you play to yourself, the words that you speak over yourself. But when you begin to utter words out loud, you begin to create an environment for those people around you. If, if the home, if the house is calm, placid, they've had a decent day, but you come home with a BA, a bad attitude, not a Bachelor of Arts, you have a BA degree, you have a BA degree, a bad attitude, you come home with a bad attitude, what happens? It all starts to tumble downhill. You get sharp, you get point. And how is that environment created? You run your mouth. You say a bunch of stuff that doesn't need to be said. Well, I'm just so frustrated. Well, then zip it. Keep your mouth shut. Better to say nothing to have people perceive you to be a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. So you just zip it. You zip the lip. Say, so listen, this is, not, this is not a good place for me to build an environment with my words in my house that's going to bring anger and derision and division and all kinds of problems. Uh, uh, Alan Dearman had his retirement party yesterday. Where's Alan? Wave your hand at me, Alan. Oh, he's, he's on the bus. Well, he, yeah, well, Alan has a retirement party yesterday. And what's neat was everybody that got up to spoke said nice things about Alan. We created a wonderful environment with our words. But let's say somebody, I won't say a name, let's say somebody stands up and starts bad-mouthing Alan. What would happen to the environment in the room? Begin to tank, wouldn't it? How does that happen? With your words, with your words. You know, I, I've had a number of bosses in my life, teachers, coaches, my parents, my spouse, and there is encouraging bosses and then there's negative bosses, right? Here's a, neg- here's a, po- here, here's a, here's a positive boss. Oh, uh, comes into the room, comes into the, comes into the office. All oh, your dedication and hard work have been instrumental in achieving our team's success. Your innovative ideas, your commitment to excellence inspires all of us, and I truly appreciate and value your contributions that each of you bring to the table. What happens? The room goes... Ting, that little crest toothpaste commercial where the tooth goes ding, you know, a little, little, little star. Boom, the whole, the whole room lights up. Same boss, same situation, comes in and says, I've noticed a decline in productivity lately. Some of you really need to step up your game. I don't want to have to micromanage you, but it seems like that's the only way to get things done around here. We need to see improvement, and we need to see it quickly. Boy. What boss would you rather work for, boss A or boss B? The one that comes in and encourages you. One of the first lessons I ever learned in my my management classes, which I did before I was in ministry, I I managed things, and um, uh, two two things. Uh, The the first thing was I complained to my boss about all these problems people kept bringing to me. It's like, these people are... and, And she, it was a she, she said to me, she goes... You know, Eric, if we didn't have problems, we wouldn't need you. Like, oh, maybe I should appreciate problems a little bit more. That's that's job security, right? So you got good spouses, bad spouses, good ways to say, hey, hey, honey, I'm so grateful for you. I love you. I support you. Your kindness and understanding makes my day brighter. Your presence in my life is a constant source of joy, and I appreciate the little things you do that make our home a warm and loving place. It's like, what can I do for you, right? Somebody says that to you. It's like, I'm in it. This is a great, we're going to have a good conversation. It's going to be a good evening. Then you have, well, I've noticed you've been slacking off lately. That's not how you start a good evening, right? Help me out, ladies. Guys, that's not how you start a good evening. I noticed you've been slacking off. (laughs) I work hard to provide for us. It feels like you're not putting in a good enough effort. You need to step it up. You need to start contributing more. I shouldn't have to remind you of your responsibilities around here. See, look at them fighting words. <laughs> them fighting words. 
your boss, your teacher, your coach, your parent. Uh, from last week, and it is a hallmark verse as well in the book of Proverbs, 1616, easy to remember, 1616, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to choose understanding rather than silver, to go after wisdom, to run your life by the instrumentation of the book of Proverbs and the word of God is so much better than a pile of gold. And until you get to that point, you're going to be chasing the wrong thing. All right, so. Uh, this idea of the power of words, power of life and death is in the tongue. I have three scriptures for you, and we're going to go through them quickly. There they are. You can write them down or take a photo. But first of all is Proverbs twelve eighteen. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Words of the reckless pierce like a sword. If somebody says something mean to you, now, there's every, every parent in the room, every, every child, all of us have heard the axiom, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is a lie. It's a lie. That words hurt. They hurt. And uh, think about the boss, the teacher, the coach, the parent, the spouse. You know what? You're just not smart enough to understand this. Never mind. Why can't you be more like? You're so sloppy and lazy, you'll never amount to anything. You sound ridiculous when you read out loud. You're so stupid. I can't believe I married somebody like you. You never do anything right. I haven't touched somebody there. I felt that one. <laughs> I don't know why I bother relying on you. Somebody mocks your feelings. They call you stupid. They call you fat. Proverbs 12, 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Secondly, Proverbs 15:1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but we are going to have an actionable truth. And that is this. A Christian home, in my most humble opinion, should, have, should, have, should be a no yelling zone. Take a picture, print it out, put it on your refrigerator. This is your actionable event of the morning. Take a picture, print it out, put it on your refrigerator. And at the bottom, I put Proverbs 51. Keep it on your phone. Make it the background imagery of your phone. You know, because you look there more than any other place during the course of the day. That in the refrigerator. No yelling. Yelling is hurtful. It's disrespectful. It results in diminished communication. It increases stress levels. It erodes trust. And you're modeling the very behavior that you don't want. 100% goes against the golden rule. Nobody likes being yelled at. And last I checked, in Galatians chapter 5, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and yelling. These are the fruits of the Spirit. No, no, no. Yelling is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the flesh. Now, some of you, you're hanging your head. Some of you are laughing like he's stepping on my toes. Well, that's because your toes are sticking out. I, listen, I am really, really serious about this. Your kids can't see you one way at home and another way someplace else. If you don't think it's appropriate to yell and scream at your spouse in the hallway of this church, then you shouldn't be doing it in the kitchen of your home. See, I took my glasses off for effect. That means like I really mean it and I'm really serious. There's no place for that. And if that's in your house, you're gonna have to work 
to have it not be there because it's a habit. Because when you raise your voice, they raise their voice. Please don't do that. Be wise. All right, back to the power of words. Proverbs uh, 12, 18, you're gonna watch your tongue. Proverbs 15, one, which we just covered, is uh, no yelling. And Proverbs 16, 24, we're gonna call that more honey. Proverbs 16, 24 says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. Jeremy Margaron, Jeremy in the house? Jeremy? Jeremy's my honey supplier. There he is right there. He's a ma- like a master beekeeper, state prizes and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I was like, you know, I, I was born, I was raised on the, like the bear honey, you know what I'm talking about? When you were a kid or whatever, you know. It's just the, the honey you buy. But when you ever taste like homegrown natural honey, it's a different honey. I'm just telling you, it's a totally different honey. My daughter's laughing at me down, down here. Why are you laughing at me? My embracing of the crunchy lifestyle. <laughs> antioxidant properties, Hannah. Honey contains antioxidants, including flavonoids and polyphenols. Like, I don't even know what that is, but that's what it says it has. Antioxidant, supposed to be good for you. Helps with your cough and your sore throat. (laughs) Number three, it helps with your digestive health with prebiotic properties, which again, it's what it says. Boost your energy. The natural sugars found in honey, primarily fructose and glucose, have a quick and easily accessible source of energy. And number five, the fifth property, Wound healing. Honey possesses antibacterial and anti-inflammatory properties that can aid in the healing of wounds. Proverbs 15.4 says what? The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. And we just read in our text in Proverbs 16.24, pleasant words are a honeycomb. Your tongue can bring healing, and that healing is the tree of life. Where do we read, hmm, 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 let's think. Where do we read tree of life? How about Genesis chapter 1? That's the good tree. The tongue brings healing, which is a tree of life. Honey-filled words bring life. I'm gonna give you something today that has radically changed my life as it relates to words. Um, I shared this with a, a good friend over the weekend and it seemed to be impactful for him. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm inclined to share it with you now. So if you don't listen to anything else, just take a listen for the next three minutes because this could be very helpful for you. I want you all to stop and think of your best, best friend. Think of your best friend for a minute. Yeah, okay, your spouse. That would be, uh, but maybe somebody outside the family, somebody, somebody you know, that you, you really, really love, you care for, that you would consider them in the best friend category, okay? Y'all have somebody? Okay, now your best friend uh, is on a diet and your best friend is, is, is not doing well, went off the wagon and ate a whole sleeve of mint cookies from uh, Girl Scouts or the peanut butter ones because you just don't eat one of those, you eat a whole sleeve of them. I'm sorry, I'm daydreaming. Um, So so you have a good friend, you have a good friend, right? And you know they they wanna lose weight and they're struggling in this area and they come to you and they say, oh man, you know, I just had a bad day yesterday, blah, 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 blah. What is your reaction? You go, you stupid fool. Is that what you say to them? No, you say, oh man, come on, you can do this. We're going to stumble. We're going to fall. We're going to have a bad day every once in a while. Let me help you. Let's do this. We can do this. Let's get, get, get on. Let me encourage you today, right? Why then, that being the truth, why then do we treat ourselves worse than we would treat our best friend? The tapes that we play ourselves, when you stumble, when you fall, oh, man, I should just give up. 
That's no good. I'm a loser. I shouldn't even try. And you start playing. You start speaking words to yourself. Listen to me. This will change your life. You start speaking words to yourself that are horrible. You wouldn't even, you, even somebody you don't even like, let alone your best friend. And you should love yourself more than you love your best friend. So why don't you say to yourself, oh man, okay, well, you know, that wasn't good, but we, we're gonna do better. We're gonna get on this. We're gonna start fresh. You can start fresh. That's what you tell your friend, right? Tomorrow's a new day. Is that what you'd say? Tomorrow's a new day. You can do this. Why not speak those words to yourself? Those types of words are like honey. They're healing to you. I'm just asking you to be as nice to yourself as you are your best friend. So back to the three main ideas of the book of Proverbs, and we'll wrap this up. We started out last week with the wisdom and knowledge. That was last week. We've taken the last 10 or 15 minutes talking about the power of words. I could preach the entire or a third of the book of Proverbs to you and talk about the power of words. That's not what this sermon is about. This sermon is about encouraging you to get into IFR flying. And say, so, you know what? I should, I should really learn how to navigate my life, not just when the weather's good. Because when things go bad, you start calling, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. How about you just turn on the instruments? How about you fly yourself out of that? Stop treating Jesus like a spare tire. Pull him out only when you have an emergency. Then to find out there's no pneuma, excuse me, there's no air in it. No spirit. Anyways, I digress. So this is, this, 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 last week, this week are all meant to bring forth a, 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 a presentation to you to say, yeah, I want to get into this. So tomorrow's Proverbs 8. There's 31 Proverbs. It's way not too late. You're going to just jump into the book of Proverbs. So the third category that Proverbs really covers, and we talked about some of these things earlier, is moral living. We, if we're real Christians, not fake Christians, not pleather, not faux Christians, but the real deal, we're supposed to be moral People are supposed to live a moral life. What does it mean? Well, I thought about that. Following God's commandments. Being a person of love and compassion, integrity and honesty. Somebody that respects other people. Having self-control, being temperate. Practicing forgiveness, being a good steward. Loving justice. Being gracious, walking in humility. Being a person that does the right thing. Great definitions, great definitions. But... Moral living is, is, is best defined like this. It's a life that reflects the character of Jesus in our thoughts, words, and deeds with a goal of bringing glory to God. That's our standard. Leave that up for a minute because that's important. To love God and to enjoy him forever. To love God and to be his ambassador, Christ's ambassadors. Back in the day, that's what they called the youth group. CAs, Christ's ambassadors. What's my goal? I, I, I want to I have the character of Jesus in my life, not just with what I think, but in my words and my actions with a goal, not to pump up myself, not for myself to look awesome, but so that God gets the glory. That's a, that's a tall example. Now, um, we're going to have a little bit of fun here for a second, okay? <clears throat> Back in the 1500s. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Okay, we're going to have some fun. Back in the 1500s, try that again. Back in the 1500s, around the Reformation, there was a very famous artist. You know his name is Michelangelo. Michelangelo, Michelangelo. Not the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Uh, an artist. And uh, he, he's, he's done some amazing, amazing things. And one of the most beautiful things he ever did was what's called the Statue of David. And it's beautiful. And when asked, how in the world did you create that? His response was, it was simple. I chiseled away everything that wasn't David. <laughs> Think about that for a second. So if you're unfamiliar with the statue, I have a couple photographs for you of the real deal. This is, this is the statue of David. Look at the veins in his hand and, and uh, his hair. 
Um, I have one of his feet, which is kind of interesting to look at. That's his feet. His back shows uh, his muscles. and I mean, think, this is, this, wait, stop for a minute. This is carved out of marble, ladies and gentlemen. It's like, ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. Right? It's not like a power grinder. grinder. You got us an angle grinder, Ryan. No, no, no. It's not DeWalt 20 volt. This is, this is Michelangelo going, with going, ding, ding, ding with a chisel. And a little hand, tink, 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 to carve all of that. Here he is. Here's another picture of him. And you're thinking, okay, big deal. Well, next picture. It is kind of a big deal. That's how big this statue is, ladies and gentlemen. If you're unfamiliar with how big the statue of David is, out of one piece of marble. And still, to give you a full understanding of how large this statue is, that one final photo. I put a QR code over his privates. I just didn't think that was going to be. Going to think that was church appropriate. But, you know, it's art. It's art. Uh, if, if, if your phone can't read the QR code, it goes to Proverbs 21.3. And this is what Proverbs 21.3 says. Listen. Do, listen. Do what is right. Do what is right and just. It is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Saul was the king of Israel. Samuel had anointed him to be king of Israel. Saul uh, had some good traits and some not so good traits. Um, The Lord directed the king of Israel, Saul, to go into this region where these people called the Amalekites, it's like Chathamites, uh, go, to, go there and destroy all those people. They're evil, wicked, and they're causing Israel all kinds of problems. So Saul went down there, and he was supposed to utterly destroy everything. And he didn't. It says in the text, he saved all the best things, it says in the text. I'm, I'm not here to recount the entire story to you, but it's, it really is quite an imp- impressive story. This is in 1 Samuel 15. It says he, he, he kept all the good things. He kept all the good things. Uh, And they were the best sheep, the best cattle, the fat calves, the lambs, everything that was good, Saul kept them. Whoa, 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 whoa. He was told, wipe the place out. So the word of the Lord comes to the prophet, Samuel, and says, go to Saul. So he goes to Saul. This is so fun. In a weird, not fun, ha, ha, fun, but weird, like weird. Samuel goes to Saul and says, and he's looking for Saul. He says, hey, where's Saul? You know what the people said? Saul's not here. He went over, he went over to the plain, to the, to, the, to the plateau over there. He's erecting a statue to himself in honor of the victory that he just had. Samuel, oh, no, no, no. So he tracks down Saul, goes out there, finds Saul. What is, Saul sees the prophet coming at him, and he, he waves at him, and he says, the Lord bless you. Saul, Samuel, Saul says that. The Lord bless, wait a second, you're living in disobedience? The blessing of a disobedient king. Says, bless, bless, bless you, Samuel. And the next sentence, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. He's lying. Bald face lie right to the man of God. The king is. Story unfolds, then says, uh, uh, Samuel says, well, then uh, what's this bleeding? What's this mooing? Why do I hear all these animals? Well, the people wanted me to keep those. Shifts the blame. Sound familiar in our own lives? You get caught. Uh, Well, you know, it's not really my fault. Saul answered, the soldiers brought them. I, 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 what we're going to do, we're going to make a sacrifice. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make a sacrifice out of all of these animals. That'll be, it'll be okay. Don't worry. Don't worry, Samuel. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord told me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become head over Israel? I anointed you, I gave you a mission, and I told you to go completely destroy the Amalekites? 
Why did you, uh, why did you save some of the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? You know what? So does, does, does uh, the king come clean? Does Saul come clean? No. Next sentence. Oh, I did obey. I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission that the Lord assigned me and I completely destroyed the Amalekites and I brought back the king and the soldiers took the sheep. The soldiers took the, took the cattle. Then the prophet says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? It is better to obey than to sacrifice. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. That's why the Lord says if you come to church and you have an offering, you're going to make a sacrifice, but you have something against your brother, you need to clear that up. Take care of it. Nip it in the bud. Because if you can convince yourself that the keeping of the sheeps and the lambs is maybe somebody else's responsibility in your life, you know, and, and you're, you're really not, you're not instrument flying in your life at all. You just kind of live in a carnal Christian life, which is not really a Christian life at all. I mean, carnal Christian, that's an oxymoron. It's not possible, right? So you're either a fake and a phony and a foe and a pleather, or you're the real deal. And so you have to say, you know what? It's more important for me to obey the commands of the Lord. The entire book of the book of Proverbs is what it's all about. This, this, this basic rules before living earth, how we live our lives, the word of God. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do those even if it's to my own, listen, even if it's to my own detriment, even if it's to my own hurt, even if I look bad. So now, so now, you know what happens at the end of the story? Saul finally, after, well, Back it up. Samuel says, okay, because of this, now the mantle is removed from you and you're no longer the king. What's that? That's the punitive action. That's the punishment now that comes to Saul because of this huge dis disobedient act that he had. Even though from the surface, he's making all kinds of beautiful sacrifices to the Lord. He's burning all the, all the sacrifices, but in his heart, it's wrong. The prophet knows it. He says, from now on, you're not the king. The mantle is removed, you're not the king. The very next thing, and we'll move on from this story because I love this story so much because it's so applicable. The very next thing, you know what he says? He says, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I repent. Well, now he repents and now he's sorry. Why? Because the punishment came. That's when you go to SWAT Junior. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're, you're sorry because you got caught. It's like the... Uh, it's like so many politicians. Can I go there just for a second? Okay, preach your own sermon there. I got to go on. I'm about out of time. <laughs> Samuel replied to Saul, the Lord doesn't delight in burnt offerings. He wants your obedience. The point, a moral life means that God gets to chip away everything in your life that isn't Jesus. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes a big chunk's got to come off, right? I, I know when Michelangelo started, he didn't start like this. I see this huge cube of marble, and he's like got the little chisel and the little hammer, and he's all the way to the top, and he just starts going. Dit, 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 dit. No, I think he went, we don't need that, <clears throat> and a big old 30-piece, 30 30-pound 30 chunk falls off. You ever, anybody have experienced that in your life where God goes, you don't need that? And it disappears, tung. And if you, if you begin to resist, if you begin to, re, begin to resist the pruning, because God says, God says he prunes in John chapter 14, 15. I'm way far afield, but this is relevant. God says he prunes, right? And we don't like that idea. We don't like pruning. I don't want pruning. But you know, if you read the story clearly, it says that God prunes the vines that are producing fruit. You prune branches, where's Nancy Phoebus? You prune branches that have flowers on them. It's already blooming, but you're gonna prune it and cut it back. Why? So it can produce more fruit. So you let God chisel these things off your life. But if you back away from and say, no, I just wanna be a visual flight Christian, and that hurt. And I don't like how that hurt. When you don't want to be transformed in the image of Christ, you're not really an ambassador. Yeah. 
See why I'm not a life coach? <laughs> I'm a pastor. I want to tell you the truth. And this right here about no yelling in your house and being kind and words and all that, that may be little chisel things. Ching, ching, ching to you. Ding, 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 ding. And you can repel from that. You can back up from that and say, oh, that, but I'm not going to that church anymore. They're always up in my business. They're always, he, that pastor, he's condemned. I'm not condemning anyone. I say we all the time, <laughs> meaning us. This is what we are going through. This is what we do. It's, it's, it's part of being bones with flesh. It's what we have to deal with. But unless you toe the line, you step up and say, okay, God, I want to be transformed into some beautiful piece of art. Bring on the chisel. Bring on the Michelangelo of your Holy Spirit and start chipping stuff away. How does that happen? When you dig into the book of Proverbs. If you don't dig into the book of Proverbs, you're just going to go through your white life flying visually. And I'm just singling out the book of Proverbs because that what, that's what we're studying. But the word of God in general is a sharp sword that, that cuts that stuff away from your life. Isaiah 64, 8, O Lord, you are the potter, we are the clay, the work of your hands. You ever thrown clay? Yeah? We have a photo. There. There. You ever thrown clay? That's what it's called. When you throw clay? Anybody? Yeah. What's the important thing? Put that booger in the middle of the wheel. Can you imagine that thing going, spinning around, and you slap it down on the edge? Whack! Or maybe it's not even spinning, and you set it on the edge, and you turn it on. What happens? Whoop! What does that tell us? Before we let the master rub out the imperfections of our life, which is the Michelangelo Holy Spirit chiseling things off of our life, which shouldn't be there as he rubs out the impurities of the clay of which you are made, the clay of our lives, and he begins to form that and shape that and turn it into a beautiful vessel or just a utilitarian vessel. God chooses what type of vessel. You need to be smack dab in the center. Some of you, oh God, and you're, and you're, and, and, the clay of your life is not centered. Now, I looked for some videos and they were all kind of cheesy, but let me just give you an example of what a non-centered piece of clay looks like on the wheel. It looks like that guy, that blow up green puppet guy out in front of the cricket, cricket uh, phone, phone, uh, uh, phone store, you know? You know that, that where they, it blows up with air and then he kind of wobbles and blah, blah, blah. That's what some Christians look like. Do you have that mental imagery? Okay. That's clay that's not centered. That's clay that's not in the middle of the potter's wheel. Jeremiah 18 tells a story like this. This is what the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go down to the potter's house and there I'll give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working on the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. I don't want to be shaped like that. He's God and you're not. Theology 101, day one, minute one, God is God and you are not. Stop trying to be the God of your life. Gosh, that'll preach. We should just stop right there. Just say amen and go home. Because isn't that the cardinal sin of most of us? I want to be in charge. I want to be the boss. I want to fly by what I can see. Then the word of the Lord came to me, verse six, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand. Stay in the center of his wheel. This morning on Facebook, I posted this outline, our final slide of the morning, I believe, and this is what you'll see as the book of Proverbs unfolds in your life. Number one, uh, this is all on one slide on Facebook if you'd like to go there for it later. Um, but we've talked about last week the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Secondly, today, the power of words, watching your tongue, a no yelling zone, remembering that your words are healing, honey. And then finally, this idea that Proverbs tells us of living a moral life is the chipping away of anything in your life that doesn't look like Jesus. I am, listen, I tell people, they come to the church, oh, pastor, I love you, you're awesome, you're great. I said, well, stick around. <laughs> so stick around. I'm gonna say something in the next six months that will make you angry, 
and you'll probably want to leave. We'll, 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 we'll see. We'll see. So God bless you. I, I mean, if that's you today and you're, oh, I love you. Pa- Pastor, this church is great. You're awesome. Pa- okay, that's good. Wonderful. Hang on. You know why? Because I'm as rough as a cob too. I got areas that the Lord's ding, 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 ding. Yeah, I still think maybe I, I'm open to the idea that there's still some 30-pound pieces of marble that got to fall off my life. I get that. I get that. I'm not blind to that. But see, if you're blind to that, then you're a Pharisee and you're a faux Christian. But if you want to be a real Christian, you look at somebody else instead of evaluating them and and seeing all the things they aren't and telling them all the things they aren't and not being their best friend and encouraging them and saying, you know what, you can do this. Right, oh man, listen, God's not done with me. God's not done with you. We're all in this together. It's a process for us. And if we'll be patient with one another, we're gonna do this. We're gonna get through it. It's going to be awesome. And you'll be much better at the end of this year than you were at the beginning of the year. By better, I mean a better reflection of who Jesus is. That's what Christ's ambassadors do, is we say, you know what? There's a bunch that's been chiseled off of me. Look at, the, look at the pile of marble rubble around my feet. That's why I love the song Alabaster Box by C.C. Winans. You, don't, you weren't there the day he saved me. You weren't there to see where I was almost 40 years ago. There's been a lot of marble chipped off this old rock, but I'm not done. Am I perfect? No. But you know what? If you stay with it, you're going to be okay. Just dive into instrument training. Don't continue to live your life with visual flight only. That's what carnal, everyday, mundane, beige, vanilla Christians do. That's not you. You're special ops. You drop out of the bottom of a Black Hawk helicopter, grease paint on, going into the territory you do at work on Monday and Tuesday. I'm going to show the love of Jesus today if it kills me. What is that? Showing the love of Jesus when you don't want to, that's a little chisel and a little hammer going ding, 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 ding. You want your way, ding, ding, ding. You want to put sugar in their gas tank and you want to, uh, uh, you want to, you, you want to smear them with uh, slander and you we would rather them die and go to hell than hear about the love of Jesus and so you become the king of your own life. Listen, if you love Jesus, you've already won the biggest battle. Right? When you die, you're going to heaven. So we should share that with those around us. Godly wisdom. Wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Stand with me this morning, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking that you would help us. Know your word. Look up here just for a second. I just, the imagery that I just had is that, you know, I've been talking about Proverbs, I've been talking about the Word, and the Word of God is sharp and powerful. It's a double-edged sword. It is the very chisel that works these things out of your life. And a lot of times we don't want to dig into the Word because sometimes it causes us pain. We see where our life doesn't live up to the standard, and so we'd rather not know the standard than to abuse ourselves with the truth. But the only way you're going to be what God's called you to be and do the great thing that God's called you to do is you get this into your heart, get it into your life. Every morning, start this month, two or three minutes on Proverbs. That's a great start. Hallelujah. Who needs prayer for healing today? Raise your hand. I know Bob and Sonia, uh, I mean, not Bob and Sonia, I mean Sonia um, needs prayer, right? Sonia needs prayer. She's back home. Good. Praise the Lord. Who else needs prayer? How's little baby Charlie? Baby Charlie's 5.1 ounces. That's amazing. Yeah? Joel needs prayer. Raise your hand. Would some people gather around these people that have their hands in the air? Some faith-filled people gather to these people that have their hands in the air, and we're going to pray for them. This is the atmosphere. Well, that seems weird. Well, how about we don't pray for them? That would be weird. No, I think we do pray for them. Okay, Father, we thank you that you're the healing God. 
And we thank you, Lord, that you are more than able to take care of any sickness, any disease, any malady, from sore muscles to cancer, from a backache to, I just hear diabetes. Those things, those things God can take care of. And so Father, we present to you these needs collectively today. Ask that you would intervene. Those listening online, those that are watching online, those that are listening on podcast, right now, just place your hand on yourself. If you don't have anybody there to lay hands on you. And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing. Not from this church and not from uh, my mouth, Lord, but from your word. By his stripes, you, Lord, these wounds, we are healed. And so, Father, we walk in healing. We're going to believe you. We're going to trust you. And we're going to see the manifestation, God, of a healing in shoulders, in backs, in arms, in eyes, in the feet, in legs. God, bring the healing that you promised in your word. Everybody find somebody that they know and love. Grab them by the hand. Father, we thank you for this family this morning. Thank you, God, that you're more than able. Anything we present to you, you are more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than ever we could ever ask. So here we are, God, asking for your help this month as we step into a place of wisdom, heavenly wisdom, flying God blind, flying blind, but trusting the instrumentation of your word. Chisel away all the things that aren't David in our lives, all the things that don't look like you. We don't want them from yelling and bitterness to anger and strife and lust. God, we ask that you would chisel that stuff away by the power of your Holy Spirit. Now we leave this place empowered, not by our own determination, but by the power of your spirit to take us to places that we didn't think we could go without your help. And so may the peace of God be on your life to guard you, to be with you, to encourage you. And may you speak good words to yourself, at least the the words you'd speak to your best friend. We leave this place, God, empowered by your spirit for your glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. 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 Last thing. Let's let's just uh, bow our heads one more moment. And if you're you're not serving the Lord or you're you're a foe or you're a fake Christian, this is your moment. You didn't think it was gonna happen, but this is it. The door has been opened. It's prepared for you to come on in. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, just raise your hand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Three, four, five, six people. You can put your hands down. Father, for those this morning that are making this commitment, Lord, as they open their heart to you today, come in. Give them a fresh start. Forgive them of their sins. Write their name in that precious Lamb's book of life. And that on that day, Lord, when we see you face to face, we'll hear those words, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Why? Because we did a little IFR flying. We trusted you, not just with what we could see, but the things we couldn't. Seal their name up, Lord, today by the glory and the grace of God. In Jesus' name. 